Okay, welcome, Mirni. So, um, what did we do? <laughs> Let me go back to try to summarize what we've done. So, <coughs> the dynamical mean field theory, the, the idea was to try to have a limit where, of the Hubbard model that could be done exactly in principle. And uh, so Metzner and Volhart showed that in infinite dimension, the self-energy is a function only of the frequency. So it means that you can write this power series uh, in terms of only local uh, local green functions. So they, they, they are all time dependent or imaginary time dependent, but still, if I write that there is a local uh, green function G I I of uh, I K N. So this means on the same site, it, it goes from site I to site I. And then it's equal, just, that's just the definition now of Fourier transform. Uh, DK of uh, two pi D of one over I K N minus epsilon K minus mu minus uh, sigma of IKN. Yes, so that's that's the green function that should go uh, into this. So, but I mean, actually, in, in principle, you see, <coughs> if it was not a local green function, if there was not this integral, it's still a self-consistent problem. So the only simplification we have done, really, is that we have a only the frequency dependence that count. <coughs> Excuse me. Now to do perturbation theory in general, it's useful to have a unper sort of a unperturbed Green's function or some Green's function, yes, that you can do, you can use to do a power series in, in U, for example. So in this problem, if it was possible to write the GII of minus one of IKN equal to some uh, G zero to the minus one I I of I K N minus uh, sigma of I K N. <coughs> then we could do we, we could do perturbation theory uh, in for this uh, problem, and then get the Green's function. And then if that Green's function is not the same as this one, we could modify this uh, G zero minus one and then find a solution. But, okay, we don't know that we can, we can write the Green's function, this I in this, uh, in this way. So we said, okay, we'll, work, we'll look at another problem, which is the, the Anderson impurity problem. And today I'm going to show you that it's the same. It, it allows us to, to do this thing. Yeah. And it has the same power series expansion as the one we, we have seen from the beginning. So <coughs> that's what I'm going to show today. But let's remind ourselves of what is this uh, Anderson impurity uh, problem. So we have some interaction uh, U on one site only. And then that site is coupled to a bath of uh, non-interacting electrons. So then we have seen that the equation of motion for this local uh, Green's function can be written this way. Okay, zeta is the is epsilon minus mu for this site there. And uh, what is this uh, delta? It's called the hybridization function. So it, re it represents the effect of all the other uh, degrees of freedom in the bath, if you want. And you see that the form that it takes is that you this matrix element allows you to hop uh, back and forth between these two. So let's say you uh, you go from site I to some uh, one of the one of, uh, of the wave vector uh, of the eigenmode, if you want, of this uh, 
where this chain the chain of non interacting electron. And then you propagate. That's the propagator in, uh, in this uh, thing. And then you come back to this. Okay. So that's a little bit in the spirit that you want of the Feynman path integral or what we saw from the very beginning that in quantum mechanics, you go from the initial to the final state by going through all possible intermediate states. So we hear the electron that is on this, this side here at time zero. You remember there, there, the time is there because of, the, uh, because of this uh, time derivative here. And because in, in quantum mechanics, the, uh, uh, we go to the interaction representation so that the interaction gives some time dependence. So, so the electron on, site, on one side uh, it has to evolve from zero to beta and it, it does it uh, through these intermediate states. So that's the Anderson impurity problem. Okay. So uh, before I show you that, uh, uh, that the Anderson uh, impurity uh, problem can be as the same, uh, okay, that has this one particle. I will show you that the Anderson impurity problem has exactly this uh, structure here. <clears throat> I will first uh, sh show you the solution of the, that is uh, suggested to us for the dynamical mean field theory. I said in, at the beginning that one of the motivation was the mud transition. So let's see uh, what we can do with the mud transition. So first I will show you these results and we uh, discuss some of the physics and so on. And at the end, I'll, I'll do this mapping, okay? <clears throat> so let's, uh, let me share my screen. Okay, so okay, so this is a, a temperature as a function of interaction, but the zero here is is just a reference to this uh, this point here, and this yellow region means that you have a uh, that uh, you have a uh, Oops, that's this one I should be looking at for single side that I'm going to use in theory, I'm sorry. It has, it's similar, but a bit different. So uh, this uh, region here is a coexistence region. So what does that mean? It means that if you start from, uh, from here, you are in a Fermi liquid, you have some metallic phase, and here there's a coexistence region. There are two solutions to the problem. Uh, uh, because the transition is first order. So it can be an insulator or a metal. And then you go to this point and then on that side, it become an insulator. So you have a metal insulator transition and uh, it ends at a critical point. So you can go continuously from this to that, okay? So that's like we saw in, um, um, in the vanadium oxide, okay? Has the same structure where you go to metal to insulator, first order transition, and that's it. Yeah. Now <clears throat> it turns out you can do that on a cluster as well. I mean, instead of having a Green's function that's completely local, uh, self energy. I'm sorry, that's completely local. It, you you can take a self energy that depends on, uh, you know, uh, on the nearest neighbor coordinates, for example. And uh, then instead of adding a single site impure, uh, Anderson impurity model, you have uh, you end up with a, with a cluster. So the, the, the result is the same. You get Fermi liquid to paramagnetic insulator. And there's a, you can go around uh, this way. It's tilted in a different way because of the entropy considerations. <laughs> Here you see the, uh, uh, the, uh, the insulator, uh, so you see it's possible here to go by raising the temperature to go from Fermi liquid to insulator. And the reason here is that in a single site, there can be 
a net spin one half, so there's a lot of entropy in the insulator. If you run the cluster, then this entropy is eaten up, and then the, this is no longer possible. OK, then what I want to show you is, uh, is this. Uh, to illustrate what we mean by this uh, uh, first order transition, I look at it on the cluster here, but it's the same as uh, on a single site. So here I have u equals uh, uh, five. Uh, let's see, my eyes are not so good here. Five, or let me blow this up. 5.0, okay. So u equals five uh, in units of t, five, u over t is five. And that's the spectral wave, the local uh, spectral wave. So you see it's a metal, okay, at zero frequency. There's lots of density of states. Now you increase u, you get to u equals 5.6, and you still have a metal here. Okay, now let's start with a larger u. We go to u equals 5.8. You see you have an insulator. Now let's start from the insulator and decrease the interaction. We go to 5.4, and we still have a little metal. <laughs> so you see, here you can have, uh, not a metal, an insulator, I'm sorry. So here you can have an insulator at 5.4 and a metal at 5.6. So it means there's a region where you have the two solutions. You have metal and you have insulator. So one of the solutions is metastable, like in any uh, first order uh, transition. So before this was understood with these methods, uh, what was uh, what happened was that uh, there was the there were two uh, pictures. There was the Hubbard picture, basically that said that uh, you start from an insulator. This is called the upper. Hubbard band and the lower Hubbard band. This is the what you saw in the solution in the atomic limit. And there was a, the, the, there were two two uh, in in the atomic limit where t is zero. There were just two delta functions. Here it's spread out. Okay, so you, so this is the upper Hubbard, uh, Hubbard band, the lower Hubbard band. You have an insulator, and then you see this gap here closes. And in the mud picture, eventually this gets together and you get the metal. There was a Brickman Rice picture. So then the Brickman Rice picture, you had a, a metal here. And then uh, it's not so obvious here on this plot, but the weight in this peak here is decreasing. So they were thinking that th what would happen is that the this peak here will just go slowly to zero. So it's as if they had in mind that Z, uh, the single particle, uh, uh, the, the uh, quasi-particle weight would go to zero. So that's what they had. So you see, in a sense, we have both pictures present, but it goes through a first order transition. You can show that this decreases uh, to zero if you go slowly all the way to this insulator. And if you go from this insulator to the metal, then this gap closes slowly. So there's a region of, uh, of coexistence going back, uh, going back here. Mm, what happened? Oh, I see. You see the this the the two points I showed you. There was uh, there was a metal here at uh, five point six and an insulator at five point four. So in reality, if you go slowly, you have a metallic solution that goes all the way here. And if you start from the insulator and you go slowly, you get you can have an insulator all the way up to here. It, it's like. Uh, uh, over uh, overheating, if you want, in, uh, in the liquid gas transition in, in water. Is that clear? Do you have any questions on this? Okay, so what happens when we dope uh, this? 
mutton slater. It's quite interesting. I won't do any calculations for that, but I'll show you the result. What happens if we don't? Well, <laughs> let's start first with a semiconductor and I'll show you how different uh, it is in the mutt uh, insulator case. So in a semiconductor, you have a, you have a, uh, a valence band and a conduction band, okay? So this is the valence band and that's the conduction band. Now, how many electrons can you put here if you have n sites? Uh, one, two, three, four, etc. You can put two n electrons in this. And in the um, in the conduction band, you can also put two n electrons. Now, if you dope the system, in other words, you start you remove. Let's say I take a limiting case where I remove just one electron from the valence band, it, the chemical potential moves here and that's it. Huh? The, the density of states is, is fixed. You just move the chemical potential. The situation is very different in a dope mutt insulator. So let's start with the mutt insulator. Okay, now the chemical potential has been shifted. The point is that if I if I add an electron here, anywhere, so that's, if you want, that's the ground state. And the, the, uh, this uh, spectral weight is the single particle spectral weight. So, so here I add a, a particle and here I re remove it. So the difference between add, whoops, let, uh, <laughs> I didn't want to do this right away. Uh, the difference between adding and, uh, and uh, removing an, uh, an electron is this energy U here. And now instead of having a weight that is a 2N in the, this lower band and 2N in the upper band, I have N in the lower band and N in the upper band. That's what you saw in the atomic limit, right? In the atomic limit, you saw that there was a one half in front of uh, this one and one half in front of this one when we are at half filling. Okay, now what happens if I dope? Okay, if I dope, let's say this is my ground state. I have one less electron here. Okay, this is really a cartoon picture, you understand? Very uh, strongly uh, correlated. Now, <clears throat> if I want to remove an electron, I just have n minus one site here where I can remove an electron. And if I add an electron, then I can add it where there is already an electron. So it means I have a peak here that has a width uh, n minus one. So what happened to the total weight? We know that there are some rules. The integral of the spectral weight is one or n here in the two n in this case. Well, there's a place here where I could put either a spin up or a spin down electron. So I have two states that show up here near the Fermi, uh, Fermi level. So you see that the this single particle spectrum changes if I change the ground state, in other words, if I dope. And that was not the case at all here in this non-interacting picture. If you look at the high temperature uh, uh, superconductors, you can do a photoemission spectroscopy. So let's say you, you see you send a photon that has a rather high energy that takes an electron that is very far here. That's, that's the energy axis. So you take an electron that's a deep, a core electron. You know, so for example, on the, on the S or P electron uh, from the, the, the copper atom in a, in a high temperature superconductor. So the high temperature superconductors have a, a two dimensional square lattice formed of copper and oxygen. Okay, so we take a, an electron from deep into a core electron and we, uh, we come with a very high energy photon and try to get it out. 
So at that feeling, you see these states are occupied, so you, you won't be able to do that. So the, the electrons have to go here. Okay, so that's uh, this peak here. At that feeling, zero here correspond to zero doping, so it's that feeling. There's a single peak. Now, if you go to, uh, so, okay, I touch my thing this too much. So, so if I dope, now when I take my electron deep here and I try to take it out of the material, there are still these states here, but there are states that are at lower energy here. So you see, if you look at the doping here of 2%, that's this uh, blue curve, you have a, something that's uh, uh, increasing. And then the blue curve here is decreasing. So there are less states here and there are more states here. And these states, they grow twice as fast as the, as the other one decrease. And you see that in here at the uh, doping of 15%, uh, you see now that this peak is twice as big as this one. You look at the red curve, this peak is twice as big as this one. So this has uh, decreased uh, twice as fast as this one has increased. Okay, I can, we can do this animation again. So this peak here is uh, N minus one. And this one is, uh, uh, is this one. So if you look at this, so the, the purple curve is uh, zero doping and the red curve is uh, this uh, uh, more doping. So, I mean, we, we don't do the, uh, the, the calculations because I mean, this is the result of experiments. Now, if you do the calculations, I tried to convince you from these simple pictures that this is what you would get. But uh, the, the, this are numerical calculation at that point. We cannot do this uh, analytically. So I show you the, uh, the result. So that. Uh, so are there any questions? It's just a quick question. Um, <clears throat> so we see at the end that the the red curve is at the same level than the purple curve. Uh, can we infer something from that, that uh, the newly created band has the same number of electrons than the old uh, double occupancy band? Or um, isn't I it suppose, possible to... Yes, I suppose, yes. Uh, but uh, it, the, this picture here is really a, a cartoon, right? I mean, the... <coughs> yeah. The weight, I mean, is not exactly two year and it's not exactly n minus one year. Uh, so it's not that if you lose an electron one time here, you get two. So I suppose that, uh, so, so you see, it looks as if the spectral weight here is not, uh, is not conserved. I mean, in the sense that uh, yes. at the end you have more uh, weight, but that's okay because you see we're losing weight here. Yes. Huh? So it's okay that we have more weight uh, mm -hmm. in this uh, region. All right, thank you. Uh, there are matrix element effects also, but I would I suspect that they would not do very much. You see, because here we have a photon of five hundred and thirty electron volts, and here a photon of five hundred and twenty-eight. So there's only two electron volts here difference, which is basically the distance between the upper Hubbard band and the Fermi level. For two electron volts, uh, but the yeah, the photon energy is uh, is huge. So, so it, the matrix element I suppose effects are I suppose are 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 the same for the purple curve and for the red curve. So it's really just a single particle uh, spectral weight that comes in. Remember when we discussed the scattering or absorption experiment. There were always matrix elements in, in front related to the probe. So that's the matrix elements I'm talking about. <clears throat> I'm saying that here the matrix elements, uh, there are matrix elements for the purple curve, but they should be the same for the red curve. So the red curve really um, represents, if you want, 
the uh, the stroke much later uh, behavior. Okay, now if you do the uh, cluster calculation, uh, what you will find is that uh, there's also a first order transition, um, not only at a filling, but as you dope the system. So in the single site, the, the dynamical mean field theory, the first order transition is between an insulator and a metal. And if you do, a, if you look at the cluster, uh, then you go from an insulator to a phase that has a lot of singlets that I call the pseudo gap phase. And then you go to a metal. But uh, in, in the same way that, uh, in, you remember in vanadium oxide, there was long range order uh, below the mud transition. So, so the mud transition in vanadium oxide, oxide, if you want, part of it, the low, low temperature part is hidden. So what you see is only the high temperature contribution. And so in the case of that I just discussed, if the, in these cluster calculations, this first order transition would be hidden by the uh, phases that have long range order. And what you would see is just the, uh, uh, it's just the high temperature uh, effects. Okay, so I will not discuss this uh, here uh, anymore. Okay, any question? Okay. So, so this part of the notes is not written up actually. So uh, yeah, you don't need to uh, you know, to do anything. Uh, <clears throat> you just have a few pictures. I need to eventually write up this part. So here, what I want to show now is that the perturbation theory for this uh, Anderson impurity model is the same. As, uh, as what we had here. So the way I will do this is that I will show that the Green's function has this structure with phi replaced by delta. So if I can show this, then I we know from this uh, that the, uh, uh, I mean, we, we see it at the Green's function level, but I will show it to you at the generating function level. Okay, so then it will be clear that uh, the perturbation theory is exactly this. So, how do we do this? Uh, the uh, I want to compute the partition function uh, z, and I write it. I will write it uh, like this. So it will. It is. Uh, uh, it is a trace of the E, I will divide now the system in, in two pieces. One piece, which is uh, uh, the conduction band, and one piece that is the, uh, the impurity. Okay. We saw that the Hamiltonian had the, the conduction band, it had the, uh, the F electron, and these two pieces by themselves commute. So I can write this as a product of, uh, instead of exponential of Kc plus Kf, minus Kc minus Kf, I can write this as a product. But now there was a piece that was this hybridization between the impurity and the conduction band. That piece does not commute with this or with that, but I can use these, this Kc plus Kf as non-perturbed Hamiltonian. And then I write a time ordered product of exponential of minus the integral zero to beta of H conduction band to F electron of tau D tau. Okay, so here I have the F and C operators that they evolve with this Hamiltonian. Okay, so that's the usual uh, thing with perturbation theory. So now what I will do is I will do the trace over the conduction band. 
and I will be left with an effective problem for the F electron. Okay. So let me write this uh, symbolically like this. So here the trace will be only uh, over the F electron. And I will do the trace over the conduction electron uh, like this. So e to the minus kf here. And then, then I write an expectation value over the over the uh, conduction electron. So I will write it with a zero here uh, to say that this is like the, you see, there's no electrons here. There are no, no interactions here. So I will write it as, uh, as zero. And this expectation value now is the one we've always used. In other words, it's the trace of e to the minus beta c, uh, the, 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 and then divided by the trace, uh, divided by the, divided by the trace of e to the minus beta uh, k uh, conduction band. So. So this piece here is was uh, was not in the original problem, so I need to I need to put it outside. So there will be the z z of the non-interacting problem, which is this conduction band. Okay, that's what I have to do. And then you see, because I will I do the trace over the conduction band, I will have an effective problem just for the f electron. Is it is that clear? Okay. Now I will use a theorem that I will show later. It's called the um, link cluster expansion. Donc en français c'est uh, de développement en graphes connexes. Okay. So if you do Feynman diagram, it's sort of one of the first theorems you need. Here we have we didn't need it up to now. And, but I will need it for superconductivity because I will do this average over the phonons to get an effective problems for the electron. So it's a theorem we will use at least twice. So I will prove it later. But now let me just uh, let me just use it. So the expectation value of e to the minus a function uh, of x. Uh, yes, is equal to. Uh, the exponential of the expectation value of e to the minus f of x uh, connected minus one. Okay, what does connected mean here? Okay, we will see it in the we will we will see it here in this context. <clears throat> so. Uh, let's assume that this theorem is true. So, so I can, I can now what I can do is I can write that this is z zero. Uh, now, uh, trace over the f electrons of e to the minus k f electron <coughs> times the exponential of uh, this uh, the, the only the connected graph here. Yeah? So the connected graphs here, there's only one in the sense that if I take the expectation value of HCF by itself, I get zero. Why do I get zero? I get zero because I have a, it will give me, you know, I'm, I'm looking at uh, the expansion of this. So this is exponential of one minus one. Okay, so, and then I have uh, minus f of x uh, connected, and I have plus one half f of x square connected. Okay, that, that's the second order expansion of this. So, okay, the one disappears. Now the expectation value of this is zero, okay? Because because I have a single creation operator, and this conserves the number of particles. 
Now the only contribution will be in this uh, F squaring. <clears throat> and there are no further connected graphs because of Wick's theorem. When there are no interactions here, if I look at the correlation function that has four operators, you have done that as a homework. It can always be written as a product of Green's functions that have only two operators. Okay. So these are disconnected graphs. Okay, so a, a connected graph cannot be expressed as a function of lower order correlation function. You know, a connected correlation function cannot be expressed as a as a product of correlation functions of lower order. So the only uh, surviving uh, thing here is the is this uh, is this one. So here, what do I have? I have um, exponential of uh, of one half, and I have uh, the square of this uh, operator. So I have integral from zero to beta uh, d tau, zero to beta uh, d tau prime. And this at the two, there was a v to hop from here to there. So I have uh, the expectation value of uh, v star ki f dagger of tau times at side i times the c k of tau okay so this has two contribution that's only one of them but I, I put one i put that one here uh you know because i just chose this one first <clears throat> and the only non-zero contribution will come for it with the, the, the square. So the other operator here, there will be, uh, there will be a C dagger, a K, there's always a spin here that I forgot, K sigma of the tau prime, F of tau prime times V, Ki zero connected. Okay, that's one of the terms. That's this term here that goes in the exponential. Now there's another contribution which comes from the uh, the, the fact that I could take this c dagger f from the first of these guys, and I could get the f dagger c from the, the other one that goes in the square. Okay, but that's a time ordered product. I mean, there was a time ordered product here. So I can always change tau for tau prime and put them back in the right order. So in other words, the, the two contributions are completely identical. So I can I can remove the one half and I have I have everything here. So I'm finished, you see. I have a quick question. Yeah. So I'm not sure why we could not use the weak theorem for this correlation function. Maybe I don't see it. Uh, for, uh, for yes, we can use Wick's theorem. But I'm saying that uh, it's, if, you use, if you use connected graphs here, the only uh, contribution is the Green's function. Okay, so, so Green's function, you know, if I expand here to higher order, if I expand this to higher order, I have, let's say, instead of, uh, instead of these uh, operators, I will have more, okay? But uh, the only ex expectation value I'm taking here are, are over the conduction electron. Okay, okay. And, and I'm saying that if I look at the correlation function that have four of these uh, conduction electron, they can be written in terms of, uh, of Green's function. So they are not connected. Okay, so, so in this uh, correlation function, we have a two point correlation, correlation function because we only take the C and the C dagger and the F doesn't. Uh, yeah, the F, we, the, the F is not involved in this expectation value here. Okay, the good. F good. is involved only here and there. Okay, I see, thanks. Okay. 
So what do I have here? <clears throat> oh my god. I'm running out of space. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, let me write uh, this now. So this is, I have uh, Z0 trace over the F electron T to the minus K times the F electron times the uh, exponential of uh, integral D tau uh, d tau prime of uh, f dagger of tau prime times delta of tau minus tau prime times f of tau prime where I have defined now uh, this function delta of tau minus tau prime I have defined it from uh, from this year and it's it's basically this you see if i take <coughs> if i go to delta of tau minus uh, tau prime <coughs> then this is the propagator the green function for the c electron of tau minus tau prime Okay, so let's look at this. You see, you have F tau, F dagger. Okay, uh, whoops, tau tau prime. So this is tau. So I have F dagger tau, F tau prime. Okay. And now this expectation value here of C tau, C dagger tau. What is this expectation value here of C dagger tau, C tau? It's G of tau minus tau prime. Okay, and then I have this, these are just uh, scalars, these are just numbers, so I've used here just the definition of the adjoint. Okay. Exaggerating over parentheses here. So, so now this looks, uh, this looks just like our our, uh, our original uh, generating function hmm? because uh, you see this is like the phi uh, phi one two um, we have psi dagger one and we have the psi two the only thing is now it's only a time uh, that comes in so the coordinates here are just the time. You know, one is tau, two is tau prime, and I phi of one, two, so it's delta of tau. Here it's uh, it's translation invariant, tau minus tau prime. But the point is that what I could do here to generate the, the, the expansion for this, you know, for if I if I want to uh, look at the use, I could add. Hmm, I could add to this exponential a source term that looks just like this. I forgot the, we still have the time ordered product here for the F electron. <coughs> so I could add uh, this uh, a little phi here. And then the only thing that would change is that my non-interacting Green's function here, the G0, contains the delta. So I have a question. Yes. Uh, before we had a phi, which was a new variable, 
And here, delta is the dependent on a G. So is that the problem for our expansion? No, that delta is, is um, a delta <coughs> depends on just on this non-interacting G. Oh, right, oh, sorry. Right? And it's been traced out. So we don't know anymore about the, the, about the, about the conduction electron. Everything about the conduction electron is in this G here or in this delta. And the bat is fixed here because it's the Anderson impurity problem. So this is fixed. Yeah. So, so we start with a problem that looks exactly like what we had before, except that the, the non-interacting green function now is V0 minus one contains this delta of tau minus tau bar. And then when I generate the perturbation theory using this phi, I will get exactly the same structure, except that the G0 is different. Another way to show that is with functional integrals. And that's a piece that I will do if you're interested at the end, but uh, it's a little bit messy to, it's very easy to use, but very messy to derive. It's based on Grassmann variables that are anti-commuting variables, and it takes a while to get used to that. But uh, if you, once you have this uh, functional integral point of view, this is easier to prove perhaps than what I did there, but you have to work hard to uh, get familiar with these Grassmann numbers and, and all of that. So I think this proof is very clear and it would be useful when we uh, see, when we derive an effective interaction between electrons that will come from phonons in this case. So the phonons will be non-interacting, we will trace them out this way and we'll get an effective interaction between, uh, between electrons. Here instead, what we get is a modified single particle propagator. So is that clear? It's a, that's the theorem I need to show now. So now the, the idea is that uh, one way to solve the Hubbard model in this approximation is to solve instead of a single impurity uh, Anderson model or a cluster, we can do it in a cluster too. And the difference is that, that this delta now will be a self-consistent thing. We start with a delta, hmm? we get a self-energy. From the self-energy, we compute a new GII from the integral ddk over 2 pi d 1 over ikm minus epsilon k minus mu minus sigma of ikm. And from this, we have the self energy and we have the g. So we can extract the g0 using Dyson's equation. And in the G zero, there is the there is the uh, there is the hybridization function. So if the hybridization function is not the same as the one we started with, we change the bat, and that's it. So there are powerful methods now to do this with Monte Carlo, uh, in such a way that the bat remains infinite. So the bat being infinite, you have infinite flexibility in this delta. In the case where you would do by exact diagonalization, you would do uh, solve an Anderson impurity model instead. What you will find is that uh, the delta is uh, sort of depends on how many variables you have to adjust. 